Once there was a very rich gentleman who lost his wife, and having loved her exceedingly, he was very sorry when she died. Finding himself quite unhappy for her loss, he resolved to marry a second time, thinking by this means he should be as happy as before. Unfortunately, however, the lady he chanced to fix upon was the proudest and most haughty woman ever known. She was always out of humor with every one. Nobody could please her, and she had returned the civilities of those about her with the most affronting disdain. She had two daughters by a former husband. These she brought up to be proud and idle. Indeed, temper and behavior, they perfectly resembled their mother. They did not love their books, and they would not learn to work. In short, they were disliked by everybody. The gentleman on his side, too, had a daughter, who in sweetness of temper and carriage was the exact likeness of her own mother, whose death he had so much lamented, and whose tender care of the little girl he was in hopes to see replaced by that of his new bride. But scarcely was the marriage ceremony over before his wife began to show her real temper. She could not bear the pretty little girl, because her sweet obliging manners made those of her own daughters appear a thousand times the more odious and disagreeable. She therefore ordered her to live in the kitchen, and, if ever she brought anything into the parlor, always scolded her until she was out of sight. She made her work with the servants in washing the dishes and rubbing the tables and chairs. It was her place to clean the madam's chamber and that of the misses, her daughters, which was all inlaid, had beds of the newest fashion, and looking-glasses so long and broad that they saw themselves from head to foot in them, while the little creature herself was forced to sleep up in a sorry garret upon a wretched straw bed without curtains or anything to make her comfortable the poor child bore this with the greatest patience not daring to complain to her father who she feared would only reprove her for she saw that his wife governed him entirely when she had done all her work she used to sit in the chimney corner among the cinders so that in the house she went by the name of cinder breach the youngest of the two sisters however being rather more civil than the eldest called her cinderella and Cinderella, dirty and ragged as she was, as often happens in such cases, was a thousand times prettier than her sisters, dressed out in their splendor. It happened that a king's son gave a ball to which he invited all the persons of fashion in the country. Our two misses were of the number, but the king's son did not know how disagreeable they were, but supposed as they were so much indulged that they were extremely amiable. He did not invite Cinderella, for he had never heard of her. The two sisters began immediately to be very busy in preparing for the happy day. Nothing could exceed their joy. Every moment of their time was spent in fancying such gowns, shoes, and head-dresses as set them off to the greatest advantage. All this was new vexation to poor Cinderella, for it was she who ironed and plaited her sister's linen. They talked of nothing but of how they should be dressed. I, said the eldest, will wear my scarlet velvet with French trimming. And I, said the youngest, shall wear the same petticoat i had for the last ball but then to make amends for that i shall put on my gold muslin train and wear my diamonds in my hair with these i must certainly look well they sent several miles for the best hairdresser that was to be had and all their ornaments were bought at the most fashionable shops on the morning of the ball they called up cinderella to consult her about their dress for they knew she had a great deal of taste cinderella gave them the best advice she could and even offered to assist in adjusting their headdresses, which was exactly what they wanted, and they accordingly accepted her proposal. While Cinderella was busily engaged in dressing her sisters, they said to her, Should you not like Cinderella to go to the ball? Ah, said Cinderella, you are only laughing at me. It is not for such as I am to think of going to balls. You are right, said they. Folks might laugh indeed to see a cinder breach dancing in a ballroom any other than cinderella would have tried to make the haughty creatures look as ugly as she could but the sweet-tempered girl on the contrary did everything she could to make them look well the sisters had scarcely eaten anything for two days so great was their joy as the happy day drew near more than a dozen laces were broken in endeavouring to give them a fine slender shape and they were always before the looking-glasses at length the much wished-for moment arrived the proud missus stepped into a beautiful carriage and followed by servants in rich liveries drove towards the palace cinderella followed them with her eyes as far as she could and when they were out of sight she sat down in a corner and began to cry her godmother who saw her in tears asked her what ailed her i wish i wish sobbed poor cinderella without being able to say another word the godmother who was a fairy said to her 
Do you wish to go to the ball, Cinderella? Is this not the truth? Alas, yes, replied the poor child, sobbing still more than before. Well, well. Be a good girl, said the godmother, and you shall go. She then led Cinderella to her bedchamber and said to her, Run into the garden and bring me a pumpkin. Cinderella flew like lightning and brought her the finest she could lay hold of. Her godmother scooped out the inside, leaving nothing but the rind. Then she struck it with her wand, and the pumpkin instantly became a fine coach, gilded all over with gold. She then looked into her mouse trap, where she found six mice, all alive and brisk. She told Cinderella to lift up the door of the trap very gently, and as the mice passed out, she touched them one by one with her wand, and each immediately became a beautiful horse of fine dapple gray mouse color. Here, my child, said the godmother, is a coach and horses too, as fine as your sister's. But what should we do for a postillion? I will run, said Cinderella, and see if there is not a rat in the trap. If I find one, he will do very well for a postillion. Well thought of, my child, said her godmother. Make what haste you can. Cinderella brought the rat trap, which to her great joy contained three of the largest rats ever seen. The fairy chose the one which had the longest beard, and touching him with her wand, he was instantly turned into a handsome postillion, with the finest pair of whiskers imaginable. She sat next to Cinderella. Go again into the garden, and you will find six lizards behind the watering pot. Bring them hither. This was no sooner done than with a stroke from the fairy's wand they were changed into six footmen who all jumped up behind the coach in their laced liveries, and stood side by side as cleverly as if they had been used to do nothing else the whole of their lives. The fairy then said to Cinderella, Well, my dear, is not this an equipage as you could wish for, to take you to the ball? Are you not delighted with it? Yes, replied Cinderella with hesitation, but must I go thither in these filthy rags? Her godmother touched her with the wand, and her rags instantly became the most magnificent apparel, ornamented with the most costly jewels in the whole world. To these she added a beautiful pair of glass slippers, and bade her set out for the palace. The fairy, however, before she took leave of Cinderella, strictly charged her on no account whatever, should she stay but a single moment after that time, her coach would again become a pumpkin, her horses mice, her footmen lizards, and her clothes be changed to filthy rags. Cinderella did not fail to promise all her godmother desired of her, and almost wild with joy, drove away to the palace. As soon as she arrived, the king's son, who had been informed that a great princess, whom nobody knew, and was coming to the hall, presented himself at the door of her carriage, helped her out, and conducted her into the ballroom. Cinderella no sooner appeared than everyone was silent. Both the dancing and the music stopped, and everybody was employed in gazing at the uncommon beauty of this unknown stranger. Nothing was heard but whispers of, How handsome she is! The king himself, old as he was, could not keep his eyes from her, and continually repeated to the queen that it was a long time since he had seen so lovely a creature. The ladies endeavored to find out how her clothes were made, that they might get some of the same pattern for themselves the next day, should they be lucky enough to meet with such handsome materials, and such good work people to make them. The king's son conducted her to the most honorable seat, and soon after took her out to dance with him. She both moved and danced so gracefully that everyone admired her still more than before, and she was thought the most beautiful and accomplished lady they ever beheld. After some time a delicious collation was served up, but the young prince was so busily employed at looking at her that he did not eat a morsel. Cinderella seated herself near her sisters, paid them a thousand attentions, and offered them a part of the oranges and sweetmeats which the prince had presented her while they, on their part, were quite astonished at these civilities from a lady whom they did not know. As they were conversing together, Cinderella heard the clock strike eleven and three-quarters. She rose from her seat, curtsied to the company, and hastened away as fast as she could. As soon as she got home, she flew to her godmother, and, after thanking her a thousand times, told her she would give the whole world to be able to go again to the ball the next day, for the king's son had entreated her to be there. While she was telling her godmother everything that had happened to her at the ball, the two sisters knocked a loud rat-a-tat at the door, which Cinderella opened. "'How late you have stayed,' said she, yawning and rubbing her eyes and stretching herself, as if just awakened out of her sleep, though she had in truth felt no desire for sleep since they left her. "'If you had been at the ball,' said one of her sisters, "'let me tell you, you would not have been sleepy. 
there came thither the handsomest yes the very handsomest princess ever beheld she paid us a thousand attentions and made us take part in the oranges and sweetmeats the prince had given her cinderella could hardly contain herself for joy she asked her sisters the name of this princess to which they replied that nobody had been able to discover who she was that the king's son was extremely grieved on that account and had offered a large reward to any person who could find out where she came from cinderella smiled and said how very beautiful she must be how fortunate you are ah could i but see her for a single moment dear miss charlotte lend me only the yellow gown you wear every day and let me go to see her oh yes i warrant you lend my clothes to a cinder breech do you really suppose me to be such a fool no pray miss forward mind your proper business and leave dress and balls to your betters cinderella expected some such answer and was by no means sorry for she would have been sadly at loss what to do had her sister lent her the clothes she asked of her the next day the two sisters again appeared at the ball and so did cinderella but dressed much more magnificently than the night before the king's son was continually at her side and said the most obliging things imaginable to her the charming young creature was far from being tired of all the agreeable things she met with on the contrary she was so delighted with them she entirely forgot the charge her godmother had given her cinderella at last heard the striking of the clock and counted one two three on till she came to twelve though she thought that it could be but eleven at the most she got up and flew as nimbly as a deer out of the ballroom the prince then tried to overtake her but poor cinderella's fright made her run the faster however in her great hurry she dropped one of her glass slippers from her foot which the prince stooped down and picked up and took the greatest care of it possible cinderella got home tired and out of breath in her old clothes without either coach or footman and having nothing left of her magnificence but the fellow of the glass slipper which she had dropped in the meanwhile the prince had inquired of all his guards at the palace gates if they had not seen a magnificent princess pass out and which way she went the guards replied that no princess had passed the gates and they had not seen a creature but a little ragged girl who looked more like a beggar than a princess when the two sisters returned from the ball cinderella asked if they had been as much amused as the night before and if the beautiful princess had been there they told her that she had but that as soon as the clock struck twelve she hurried away from the ballroom and in the great haste she made had dropped one of her glass slippers which was the prettiest shape that could be and the king's son had picked it up and had done nothing but look at it all the rest of the evening and that every one believed that he was violently in love with the handsome lady to whom it belonged this was very true for a few days later the prince had proclaimed by sound of trumpet that he would marry the lady whose foot should exactly fit the slipper he had found accordingly the prince's messengers took the slipper and carried it first to all the princesses then to all the duchesses in short to all the ladies of the court but without success they then brought it to the two sisters who each tried all she could to squeeze her foot into the slipper but saw at last that this was quite impossible cinderella who was looking at them all the while and knew her slipper could not help smiling and ventured to say pray sir let me try on the slipper the gentleman made her sit down and putting the slipper on her foot it instantly slipped in and he saw that it fitted her like wax the two sisters were amazed to see that the slipper fitted cinderella but how much greater was their astonishment when she drew out of her pocket the other slipper and put it on just at this moment the fairy entered the room touching cinderella's clothes with her wand made her at once appear all more magnificently dressed than they had ever seen her before the two sisters immediately perceived that she was the beautiful princess they had seen at the ball they threw themselves at her feet and asked her for forgiveness for the ill-treatment she had received from them cinderella helped them to rise and tenderly embracing them said that she forgave them with all her heart and begged them to bestow on her their affection cinderella was then conducted dressed as she was to the young prince who finding her more beautiful than ever instantly desired her to accept his hand the marriage ceremony took place in a few days and cinderella who was as amiable as she was handsome gave her sisters magnificent apartments in the palace and a short time after married them to two great lords of the